morning, good afternoon, good evening, may ever, wherever you may be. Uh, welcome to our spotlight session today uh, on Pharma Ledger and electronic product information and a counterfeiting focus. My name is Daniel Fritz. I am a supply chain domain architect at Novartis. I'm also the uh, Pharma Ledger industry lead, uh, which, we'll, which we'll introduce in a little bit more detail today. And I'm uh, leading the anti-counterfeiting use case. I'm joined today by, by two colleagues, Ken Thursby from Merck, from MSD, who will speak later, and Patrick Marr, also from uh, Novartis, uh, who will also present and do a demo, which I'm sure you're looking forward to. Uh, just as a, a note, I believe there is an opportunity for you to ask some questions and uh, in the Slido uh, screen, so please do take that opportunity. We intend to leave plenty of time for us to get to the questions at the end of the um, uh, at the end of the session, following the slides and the demo. Uh, short disclaimer: these are our our own views. And we will go ahead and get started now with um, a vision of blockchain-enabled healthcare. So we'll jump right in. Uh, what we're presenting today is a use case or a couple of use cases that are part of the Pharma Ledger project. Pharma Ledger is a an IMI or Innovative Medicines Initiative project, which is um, uh, under the umbrella of the European Union and the European. Uh, Pharmaceutical Trade Association, FPIA. It's a three-year project uh, that kicked off a year ago or in January of 2020 with 29 partners, including 12 um, pharmaceutical companies and 17 public partners. It's resourced at 22 million euros and is the main aim is to demonstrate the value of blockchain-enabled uh, solutions in, in healthcare. And in order to do that, what we are doing is demonstrating uh, different use cases or prototypes in these areas, supply chain, clinical trials, and health data uh, in, in, with, a, with a use case demonstration in order to prove the value. Also showing that a, a, fun, a foundational platform can support multiple use cases across different, um, uh, different functions in the company or in the ecosystem. Uh, we're also focusing on key areas like data privacy, protecting patients' confidentiality, um, also on governance because this project needs to have something that actually can uh, continue on following the, uh, 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 the project's end in 2022, in December 2022. This is uh, Pharma Ledger in a nutshell. That said, uh, there's a lot more information on Pharma Ledger in our virtual booth, so I would invite you to please join um, that in the in the um, out in the session area, um, where you can get into more more detail concerning the project. Um, just uh, who's in this project? As I mentioned, 29, 29 members. Here you can see um, the industry members. We have a, a number of different technology companies involved some technology universities and research organizations. Um, we also have two patient organizations um, involved, uh, a government authority, which is the Portuguese Mint, an expert in uh, anti-counterfeiting, and some hospitals and contract research organizations. I've, I've mentioned the, the key focuses of Pharma Ledger, patient empowerment on health data, supply chain transparency, clinical trial efficiency, also some of the key objectives around privacy, governance. Um, and so I, I think we will, we will go ahead and continue on um, in order to make sure we still have enough time for the, for the questions and answers. This is how it's basically organized. I think um, just to, to, to share with you the organization, we, we have this um, business use cases, we have the applications developed themselves, the underlying platform or architecture. There's a focus on governance, um, regulatory legal data privacy um, is of course key and culture and adoption awareness and education is of course uh, very important for blockchain as it's currently at, at its current stage, which is one of the reasons why we're, we're here today. One thing to mention I think is that um, all of these 
all of these work packages, all of the, the use cases, um, all of the, the, and at the project level are co-led by both one from the industry and one from a public partner. So it is really a collaboration and a partnership. Where are we in the journey? We are uh, in year two, development and deployment, where we have defined what the use cases are, and now we have uh, started developing, creating demonstrators, which you can use um, in order to do some pilots or some experimental pilots um, in, in the future. Uh, fortunately, for the case of EPI, EPI which you'll see today, that there are quite some, um, they're quite advanced in this regard and we're, we're able to um, show something um, to you live. Uh, but uh, just to provide the complete picture, uh, this is where, again where I would like to invite you to, to, to join the, the virtual booth that Pharma Ledger has. We have other use cases in healthcare and in clinical trials, um, also in supply chain, uh, where um, we're focused on proving the value of blockchain. So with that, I will now turn it over to, uh, to Ken to go into the details of, on EPI. Uh, so hi, everyone. My name's Ken Thursby. I am part of Global Supply Chain Management in MSD, and I'm also the co-lead for the Pharma Ledger EPI use case. Um, what I'd like to do now is do a deeper dive into two of our use cases to show how the blockchain platform has multi-use and can deliver value to, uh, to stakeholders. Um, what we're seeking to build is this platform which enables security and trust for data exchange between ecosystem players. So in the case of electronic, electronic product information, EPI, that's a digital version of the paper product information, the leaflet that would be in a pack of um, pharmaceutical drug product. And then for anti-counterfeiting, this use case is about um, giving assurance and trust to the patient that the product in their hand is authentic. Next slide, please. Okay, so a key concept in blockchain is the idea of the value bundle. So each use case in its own right is valuable, but when you layer these in on one on top of the other, you create a bigger value bundle. Okay, so this is what we're depicting by this uh, diagram. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about EPI and anti-counterfeit checks. These are just two of the use cases. There's many, many more. We had over a hundred when we first started looking at this. This is just to give you uh, an idea. Uh, to imagine what it could be like when you've got a digital connection between the ecosystem players, patients, manufacturers, and health authorities. Uh, and all of these add up to create this uh, blockchain, digitally enabled healthcare value chain. So an example, once you've got a, a digital connection to show an API to a patient, it's very conceivable to think of a world where a patient could report adverse events back to manufacturers and health authorities. Um, finished goods traceability is another interesting use case. Imagine a world where when a product is dispensed, you get an anonymous uh, geolocator back to the manufacturer to say one unit has been consumed. That gives a picture real time of demand, which helps manufacturers meet uh, demand with supply and avoid shortages so patients always get their medicine. So that's the idea of the uh, value bundle. Next slide, please. So, okay, we've got the blockchain platform. How, how do we connect into it? Well, thankfully, we've got this humble barcode. This is the 2D data matrix, which the industry has spent millions of euros on over the years for serialization. And this barcode has some very special properties because there's four pieces of data embedded in that code. The GTIN, the Global Trade Identification Number, which is the unique product number. The lot number, the expiration date, and the serial number. And these four bits of information are used across the value chain from the manufacturing plant all the way to the patient and beyond. So using this uh, digital key, we can offer additional services and enable the bundle. So an example, 
with the G-TIN, we can offer the latest e-leaflet. If you add in the lot number, you could potentially give a batch specific leaflet. So if the ingredients were to change, uh, say the excipients from one lot to another, you could give the specific ingredients for that product, plus the latest label information, or say new indications. That's a very powerful combination. Expiration date, uh, an example with that, let's say you've got a new product like a COVID vaccine, where you don't have much stability data, that normally leads to short shelf life, right? Then as we build up more data on stability over time, it's possible using the blockchain to communicate uh, dynamic expiration dates. Um, some kind of messaging person scanning to say, yes, this is expired on the pack, but it's been extended um, due to increased stability data, something like that. So it gives you an idea how we could use this um, 2D code investment, this asset that we already have to enable more digital value to be delivered across the value chain. Next slide, please. Okay, so a question for you, and this is one for you to think about when you're engaging with Slido. Can blockchain help realize the promise of EPI? Uh, EPI itself is not a, a new idea. It's been around for at least a decade from the folks we've been talking with in the industry. There's lots of benefits which are wild, uh, widely understood, uh, not least readability of the print. And you can see a picture of a, of a leaflet there on the top right hand corner, there's a person behind it. You know, these leaflets are big and some of them are even bigger than this. It's not easy to search for the text or to find what you're looking for. Updates in the paper world aren't instant. We need to design the leaflets when they're updated. We need to change the design. We need to print them. We need to fold them, put them in a carton and they need to flow through the value chain before they get to a physician's office or a pharmacy. That takes time, which limits availability. And as an industry, we produce billions of these a year. So there's a cost to produce. And of course, the environmental impact of the single use bit of paper, which is thrown in the bin. So with all these benefits, why, why hasn't it happened in 10 years? Why hasn't it happened? Well, of course, the answer is complicated. We don't live in a black and white world, right? Um, one of the reasons though, is we are a closely regulated industry, okay? Health authorities need to trust that manufacturers are giving the statutory information that we're not promoting other um, products or upselling in a digital world. The patient needs to trust that the information is the latest information and correct and um, so that they can take their medicine safely. Um, and there's lots of other digital initiatives going on. We, with so much going on, wouldn't it be good if we could have the interoperability within these different initiatives to provide linked up value with end to end thinking. So the idea of blockchain is we could enable those things. So as we go through this at the end, do, do uh, ask yourself this question, uh, could it help? Next slide, please. So here's our vision. Uh, we are seeking to connect three major industry ecosystem players, health authorities, manufacturers, and end users. We want to do this using the transaction infrastructure, which is the blockchain. And we're seeking to do this for eLeaflet across its entire end-to-end -end life cycle, from creation of the content by the manufacturer, through the review and approval cycle with the health authorities, to trusted storage of that e-content asset and then sharing with the patients and healthcare practitioners for dissemination. We're seeking to do this through the barcode for access, and we would use a back, back end blockchain technology called the uh, resolver to point to the correct DSU. DSU is a, uh, a data storage unit. It's a decentralized technology where manufacturers would put an XML version of their leaflet in there. And that's what the patient will get back. There's uh, no need to go to a, a, a website for this. Um, you're getting it the just the pure XML file with no other information about other products. So it replicates what happens in the paper world. And of course, 
in the paper world, we have a decentralized model where every manufacturer looks after their own leaflets. Why not replicate that in the e-leaflet world as well? And by decentralizing, we spread the work out and avoid a bottleneck with all e-leaflets going through one point. You can imagine how busy that would be with something like two and a half thousand MA holders in Europe alone, with thousands of products. Okay, so that's a little bit about the e-leaflet use case. I'd now like to hand over to Dan to talk through how we could layer in the anti-counterfeiting use case as well. Thanks, Ken. So with a EPI resolver, which you saw, and the enablement of a digital electronic version of the product information, we, we realized or we recognized that this is already in one case and one way, a plausibility check on the, on the authenticity of the medicine. Uh, so just by realizing electronic product information, you're, you are also increasing the certainty that that is a, an authentic product. And that's important because anti-counterfeiting is unfortunately, or counterfeiting or falsified medicines generally, is unfortunately still uh, a huge issue, and it is a it is a growing issue. Um, there are there are big opportunities for criminals to make money in counterfeit medicines, and we maybe you've seen or or heard re of recent examples uh, due to COVID, uh, where personal protective equipment or even or even vaccines have been uh, identified as counterfeits. And this is uh, this is an issue which is impacting patient safety. So, by some uh, uh, estimates, the hundreds of thousands of, of people um, are are actually uh, dying per year because of counterfeit medicines. Their their overall health is also is also impacted um, through the uh, substandard products. This this this. Not uh, this also creates um, issues in the the trust in the system um, and the efficiency of the system because things cost more. Uh, they have to be done twice. I mean, uh, you can see how actually even yesterday saying if if when when the the um, effectiveness of a medicine is called into question, it creates kind of shock waves in in the whole ecosystem. So, uh, trust is is kind of the the ultimate factor that you want to have not only in the information but of course in the efficacy of the medicine you're taking. And bigger term, this is uh, this is a uh, if criminals are making the money, then um, governments or import export um, man valid manufacturers. This is a, this has an overall economic impact as well, which we which uh, is significant. So what are we what are we proposing with uh, the anti counterfeiting use case? It's it's basically broken down into two different parts. One is called uh, multi factor product authentication or MFPA, similar to what you do uh, when you're logging on to your account or something. You may have to enter a code or your mother's maiden name. Um, what we what we do and this starts from top from left to right, top down. Uh, we we. We do EPI. We we do the, the the patient scans that data matrix and sees if there's a leaflet. Um, that's already the first check. Is it a valid product? Uh, on top of that, we can check. Uh, it's also reading the serial number, so we can check is that a valid serial number. It's checking also the expiry date. Could also check other product status, whether or not that that product has been reported stolen uh, or hasn't been released to the market yet. It can also determine whether or not there is an authentication feature associated with that product that can be checked either remotely or locally by, by the user. So a user could use their smartphone, um, determine that, take a picture of it, and then a backend system would validate um, the presence of that feature, which is then basically a, um, saying that the packaging is authentic. And there could be other rules as well um, defined which uh, uh, could be done. The, the good thing is this is all um, done kind of real time so that, um, so that the, the, the patient has the, the latest and greatest status on this medicine. Finally, there are 
there's a possibility to use um, the data from these checks while preserving patient privacy um, and being GDR, GDPR compliant in order to get kind of leverage the big data aspects of it and to get bigger insights into the, the problem and how to fight the problem. So we, we have individual packs showing up, but if we're able to see trends, geographic trends or product trends, then, then this is kind of a, an additional tool that can be used in this fight. And another um, version of this, and this is, this is the same, this is the same uh, view, but all we're saying is instead of just um, leveraging this for pro public uh, use, uh, for patients, this can be expanded um, to other entities as well in terms of um, uh, distributors, law enforcement or inspector, inspectors. Um, so this is, it's built, it's designed to kind of build on the existing legislation that we have, leverage the, the same data matrix that, uh, that's in place, um, perform this multi-factor authentication and then um, with the consolidated data, um, to get greater insights again into the counterfeiting problem and to fight it in, in new and more effective ways. So that's the, the anti-counterfeiting um, uh, uh, component of the, of the use case. And I will turn over uh, to Patrick, I think, for uh, the next part. Uh, hi all, um, my name is Patrick Marr and I work for Novartis within the global engineering function where I'm one of the responsible persons for serialization and track and trace and also one of the responsible persons for API. Um, in PharmaLedger I'm one of the API use case co-leads along with Ken whom you just met. Um, over the next few slides I will try to give an overview of the collaboration uh, activities and the upcoming proof of concepts or POCs that are planned. Um, I will also describe and demonstrate the value bundle that uh, Ken alluded to that Farmer Ledger is proposing. Um, I hope it meets everybody's needs and expectations. So please ask, uh, feel free to ask questions or ask for clarifications. Um, the one thing I would say is that we don't have all the answers to all the questions, um, nor do we necessarily know all the questions right now. Okay, so that that is something that we're looking at here. Um, from, from this slide here, I think one of the, the key points on this slide here are the collaboration and the action um, that we're looking at. Um, collaboration is of paramount importance to us um, because we want to build upon all the excellent work that has been done so far. So with, with that in mind, uh, Pharma Ledger and the GI 4.0 team um, are exploring the opportunity to exp uh, expand the value bundle to patients. So on the GI or the GI 4.0, um, that, uh, that pilot, they're able to scan the data matrix code and go and get a leaflet. Um, it's the latest leaflet. So we're looking to build in the opportunity, what we can add into that from that perspective. And then in the Singapore, um, the Singapore Health Authority are very, very open DPI, and there's an ongoing pilot at the moment. Uh, the use of QR codes, for example, is, is allowed there. Um, we have the, the EDB, which is the Economic Development Board, and the IMDA, which is I think is the Infocom Media Development Authority, they're both government agencies. Um, and they're very much in, into um, blockchain as a technology, um, and they also have a fund available for this. So what we're looking to do here is to put the theory into practice and get feedback from the various different stakeholders. So. A lot of like a lot of places we have like EPI on a phone, so we can scan a code and get a an, an EPI. But we're looking to add a bit more value into that. Okay, uh, Dan, next slide, please. So in the last slide, we we discussed we we mentioned Pharma Ledger, GI four point zero, and Singapore, which is the the trade organization SAPI. Um, you can see from this slide that we have all the players involved in the different organizations. And you see this sweet spot in the middle there. There's a number of companies that are involved in all three areas. Um, so what the idea here is that we're looking to is to build upon that. We're all doing the same thing across the world. So we're looking to build a global solution. So we don't want a region or specific one because this just adds complexity and we will not get beyond EPI on the phone. And we may not even get to um, realizing EPI in its full potential. Um, so to us, the um, collaboration and action is a key thing. So we're testing out the different technologies 
what can be used, what should be used. And as I say, we have a lot, a lot of questions that we still have to get answered. Okay. Um, we have no, some members are uh, confirmed and some others are not confirmed for these pilots to participate. So on the next slide, please. Okay. Um, I would like to take you through four key features of the EPI blockchain value bundle that Ken alluded to earlier. Um, I'll just go through obviously one to four. Um, the first one is the, the multi-use of the digital key. Now, when we talk about the digital key, um, we often talk about uh, the data matrix code, the GS1 data matrix code with the G to batch serial number and expiration date in there. So we want to utilize that information to, in, um, to basically uh, ensure that fake medicines are not legitimized. Um, as Ken mentioned earlier on. Um, we also need to understand that uh, not all the serialized markets have a central database. And, and by central database, I mean, I'm, I'm referring to what we have in Europe. And I know that it's not a central database. We have all the national systems. But essentially, with the intermarket, tra intermarket transactions, we can assume it's that not every region in the world has that. And they may not be able to implement such a system for many, many years. So we need to figure out how that has to happen. We also need to be conscious that there are other barcodes in use. Okay, so not every country is using the are serialized and are using the data matrix code. For example, the composite code in um, Japan. Um, so while we do consider the data matrix code to be the the best one for us, um, we are uh, actively looking at other codes as well because that that will aid with adoption and across the supply chain. Um, feature two is the trusted content. Um, Ken mentioned this earlier, but I will just reiterate it again. The pharma ledger approach, it doesn't direct us to a, a patient, uh, it doesn't direct the patient to a company website or a third party website where non statutory information could be made available. Um, essentially, in simple terms, the, the leaflet is loaded onto the person's phone, and that's what they will see. Um, there's a patient friendly version of it. I mean, there is the thought you could load a PDF onto it, but a PDF on glass essentially would not be particularly a patient friendly uh, version to show. Um, so I will hope to show, I will show this in the upcoming demonstration. We have a short video coming up in the next couple of slides. And then feature three, feature number three is the patient centric app. Um, what we want to do here is we don't need, or the patient does not need a Novartis app, an MSD app of anybody else's app. We want to have one method essentially we're talking about a method of getting the, um, the EPI as opposed to an actual app. It's not the intention that there would be one app that would rule everything and there'd be no other apps available, of course. Um, so the concept here is that there'd be, we could scan a code from any manufacturer and get the leaflet. So we will show this in the upcoming demonstration as well, that I can scan a Novartis code, a GSK, an MSD code to get the leaflet. That's, that's very, very important, I think, you know. And then we have the number feature number four is the patient friendly approach um, to issues with EPI and authentication. Um, we have what we call the, the happy path and the non happy path. The happy path is when everything works fine. So I scan a code and I get the leaflet. Um, then we have, the, we have to consider also the non happy path. So I can scan a code, but what happens if the, there's something there's an issue with the batch number, the serial number, or the expiration date, for example. There's some issue there in the code. Um, should I display the patient leaflet, for example, or the SMPC or whatever information else we're showing there? Um, would this potentially differ from company to company or from region to region or country to country? These questions. Um, the demonstration that we will show soon will be that uh, we can technically detect these things, but the questions we have are what, should, what would be an appropriate message to show to the patient in these examples? Okay, so Dan, do you want to jump to the next one, please? So over the next two slides, um, I have seven different, we have seven different scenarios. Um, we have one to four here. These are the happy path. So basically everything works as expected. And then on the next slide, we'll, go, we'll come to that in a moment, but uh, uh, when we go to that, they're, they're on happy path. So in the first example here, you will see that it's a Novartis product. The second product there, number two, is a GSK product. And then products three and four are uh, Merck products. Um, what we want to show here is that I can scan the, the code, uh, the number one, get the, the leaflet and get the information, and everything verified. Uh, number two, the same, and number three, uh, the same thing. So essentially one, two, and three are shown. I can scan different codes from different companies and get the information. And then number four is um, an enhancement on 
it's, it, I can mention earlier about having a batch specific leaflet. So you can see that number three and four, the GTINs are the same. But when I scan four, or when we scan four, you will see that there is additional information in there specific to this batch. Okay, next slide, please, Dan. And then five, six, and seven, these are the unhappy path scenarios. Um, the first one is the serial number is unknown, so it wasn't loaded as part of the batch. What should be done in this example? Should something be shown to the patient or not? Um, and we can do the same with the expiration date. If the expiration date did not match, it would be a similar thing. Um, number six, um, in this instance, the, the expiration date in that code is the 24th of January 2021. It's now the 16th of March 2021. So when I scan this, or when the patient scans this code, what would be an appropriate message to show to them? We can detect that this product has passed its expiry date. So what would an appropriate message be? And then number seven here is the unknown G10. So in this example, or this G10 or NN10, um, in this example, we would scan this code, but what would we do? We can't find any information about it. Um, what, would be an, what, what would an appropriate message be? There could be various reasons as to why that happened. Um, and so, so these are the questions that we have to get answered to next. So um, next slide, Dan, please. And we have an upcoming two minute video that will go through the, uh, the, the slide, okay? So this is the, uh, the demo, this is the app that was being developed in order to show the value bundle. So you can see the data matrix at the bottom left hand corner. If you clicked on that, it'll ask you to do that the camera, of course. Then we start scanning the product. So this is the Novartis product, okay? So we scan it here and we can get the information. You can see um, all the information on the top there. Um, we, this has a patient information. So we click on the patient information and we get the patient information, inf the details. So this also has an SMPC. So I can get, we can get the SMPC. We did this just to show we can actually do both. So we then scan for the next product and this is going to be a GSK product. So we have all the details. I scan the product. You can see all the details for GSK, the serial number, etc. Um, click on the patient information to get the patient information button. So we're now, it's the same app, same method. We're getting the different information from different manufacturers. We scan the next product, which is the Merck product. And this, this one here. And we get the information. Uh, we go to the patient information. And you can see under recent major changes, of three changes. Now, this is important. Um, in this instance, there's three for this particular batch. So we now scan the next one, and this is showing the batch specific information. So you'll see the G10 for both of those is the same. So I scan it, I go back there, and I go to recent major changes. And now I have four recent changes here. So this could be that we've added something, uh, as Ken alluded to earlier. Now we'll come to the unhappy path scenarios, the unknown serial number. So this serial number is unknown. Um, we can detect it. Now, the question is, what should we show to the, the patient here? Should the information be shown or not? Uh, would that vary to country to country? The next scenario is the this passes expiration date. So the expiration date, I think it was the 24th of January 2021. Um, so we scan this product what would happen? We can detect that the product has expired, but what would an appropriate message be? Should we show something? Would it matter country to country? Um, the next one is the unknown G10. So this could be that uh, it's a fake product. It could be something else. Now, this message is not of particular use to anybody. Okay, That's, that's very clear. But um, what would an appropriate message be? Because it, there may be various reasons as to why this is the way it is. It might be the company is not participating in the platform. It could be a technical issue, or it could be um, it could be a, a, a fake medicine. Um, I hope that short video and explanation was of value. Um, Dan, we can now continue with the remainder of the slides, please, and I'll hand it over to Ken, I believe. Thanks, Patrick. Um, it's always great to see. Uh, to see the prototype working, because I, I think with the prototype, it, it brings it to life. Um, it answers some questions, but of course it makes us ask more. So again, uh, please use the Slido if you've got questions about uh, the demo. So um, moving on to the stakeholders uh, and why we're using uh, blockchain and EPI as one of our use cases. Uh, the key thing here is that EPI has benefits to all ecosystem players, the health authorities, patient groups, manufacturers. 
So if we're able to uh, do EPI in a trusted and secure way, uh, with benefits to all these stakeholder groups, we believe that this will help the paradigm shift for us to go from paper to electronic. And you can see there's a, lo a lot of benefits here. Um, one that I particularly like is around the patient groups. Um, imagine uh, a world where we get an e-leaflet available to a patient or healthcare professional as soon as it's approved. We could do that in a digital world and that could have very positive implications. Let's say you're a, a cancer patient, um, you've got brain cancer and there's a, a product which has just got health authority approval for this new indication. We could make that available instantly, which means that the healthcare practitioner can administer it to you as the patient and that could be life changing. Um, so I really like that idea of being able to enhance outcomes for patients. I don't know uh, whether Dan or Patrick has a favorite on this. For, uh, for me, Ken, I think it's the environmental aspects of this. Um, I mean, the, the leaflets are valuable. There's a lot of valuable information on there from, the, from a patient perspective. But anecdotally, like when I speak to my friends and family, like I'm not sure how many of them actually read it. Um, and the, the, it's literally just thrown in the bin. And the paper industry is a very intensive and industry. Um, so for me, that's one of the, the key benefits of this. I mean, we need to take care of our dwindling resources, you know, so, but there are, there, all the rest of them are valuable as well, of course. Absolutely. I like it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, um, you, the audience can think about what would be most important to you in, in your role as an ecosystem player. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. Um, so in this story that is blockchain, um, what does the ending look like? Well, of course we don't know, but we're trying to imagine what it could look like. And the first thing um, with EPI and blockchain is we want to avoid tragedy, all right? Tragedy would look like this, uh, patient confusion. Imagine if you have multiple barcodes on a pack, which would the patient scan? We want to avoid that. Just use the barcode that's on there, the asset we've already invested millions of euros on. We want to avoid lots of different EPI solutions. Um, MSD does business in something like 170 plus countries around the world. Imagine if we had 170 different solutions, how difficult that would be to manage as a global business. Uh, by having fewer solutions um, and solutions that work, um, we think that would help running a global business. We want to avoid added complexity. So um, in today's world, paper is the primary way of getting information to a patient. And then we're adding in electronic on top of that. We think by looking at the entire end-to-end -end process from creation through review, approval, and dissemination, we can find areas where there's intermediaries or duplication and reduce that. So therefore helping um, reduce complexity for the electronic solution and make that more viable. And last but not least, of course, we don't want to legitimize fake medicines. We've actually seen cases of a, of a falsified medicine pack with a QR code on, on it. The QR code's not, uh, it's, a, it's a kind of barcode, but it's not like the 2D code. It's just a pointer to a website. So we've had a fake medicine pointing to a legitimate website. Um, if you're a patient, you could easily be hoodwinked into thinking that the um, medicine was legitimate because you've gone to a legitimate website. So that's the that's the tragedy we want to avoid. Um, what what does it what does good look like? Uh, what what would it mean for us to experience success? Well, wouldn't it be good if we had a trusted platform? for secure data and information exchange between ecosystem partners. Um, wouldn't it be good if the digital product information wasn't just equivalent to paper, which many are seeking to do, but better? Um, because of the value bundle, we think digital PI in the future world would be much, much more valuable than its paper counterpart. We desire global standards for eLeaflet. Now, that is going to be, of course, incredibly difficult to attain, but 
if we can standardize as many elements as possible, that not only helps um, manufacturers manage the complexity, but it also helps um, adoption of the solution. So if you imagine we're working with a couple of pioneer countries right now, Germany and Singapore, there are others, uh, Norway, Finland, Spain, uh, there's lots of other countries all doing pioneer activities. If we were able to agree on some standards, the pioneer countries and the close followers and even countries that aren't even looking at EPI now, it would make it easier for them to adopt and therefore give the benefit of EPI to more patients around the world. And last but not least is about flexibility. Uh, so Patrick talks about action. Um, we want to make it easy for ecosystem players to take action and use it. And we have to appreciate that each nation is on a different um, part of the journey for EPI. There's some that are more advanced and some that are less advanced. For the more advanced, we want to offer a bridge to the blockchain platform to enable um, more ecosystem players to join and get the benefits from the digital bundle. So uh, next slide, please. That brings us to the, uh, the end of the presentation section. We're, uh, we're a few minutes ahead. Um, so on behalf of Pharma Ledger, I'd like to thank you for listening and I'd like to open up the floor for Q&A. Great, thanks, Ken and Patrick. Uh, Dan here, I will do my best here to moderate uh, the Q&A. Uh, and uh, I think we've got all the questions in Slido. There's, I see four questions. So if you've got other questions, please go ahead and 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 enter them, um, so that we have them. Uh, but we can go ahead and get started. And I'll just take them top to bottom, uh, with what has got the most likes. So the first question is, how critical is the role of ISO IDMP? which is SPORE in the EU, in the ability to connect our, our global supply chain. Uh, I can take a shot at this and um, maybe then Ken or Patrick, you can, you can add. Uh, so, so I think, you know, generally for adoption of, um, of uh, blockchain solutions, we have to rely on standards. Uh, and and agreement that these standards then um, uh, are is uh, existing standards, ideally, rather than creating any new new solutions. Uh, with Pharma Ledger, you know, we've we've identified that the identity of a um, of a product, of a person, or of an organization is is kind of foundational for the realization of all of our use cases. And SPORE um, is, stands for substances, products, organizations, and I think referentials. It is the uh, approach taken for uh, standardized identification uh, of, of organizations and products um, in support of the IDMP. And so, um, yes, it's important. Um, and and when we, we have uh, within Pharma Ledger a a separate task force called the Identity Management Task Force. We are working together with uh, GS1, the supply chain global standards, the uh, kind of the owner of the, the data matrix um, standard, um, as well as um, GLIFE. This is the Global Legal Entity uh, Identity Foundation. So they're um, looking at um, organizational uh, identifications and and spore is also um, included in this as we we believe the systems there and there may be and there will be many more they need to be interoperable we've we this is a question we've discussed many different times some people may rely on a on a glyph identifier some some may rely more on a spore identifier some will rely on a gln identifier depending on their perspective and their purpose. So, so generally, I think the answer is that, you know, standards um, are a prerequisite for, for collaborating together on these types of, of uh, problems. And, um, and SPORE is, is, is definitely part of that. Anything to add, Patrick? 
Patrick or Ken? No, Dan, I think that covered it all from my perspective. But um, the other thing I would say that for even for EPI, like even with serialization that we've done, um, the master data components and standards are very, very yeah. critical to us. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so the next questions, what happens when people in the sell out channel, uh, for example, the community pharmacy stick their own POS, I guess that's the um, proof of sale or barcode over the barcode in the secondary patch packaging. So when what what happens when a local pharmacy relabels it with their own barcode? So it, it's uh, it's Ken here. I can take a stab at this one. So I can see that being a problem today. Actually, if the uh, point of sale uh, sticker is put over the serialized barcode, then that would prevent the pharmacy doing a serialization check um, when they dispense the medicine. So um, I think it's a good point that's made by this question because there are behaviors in the channel which aren't always visible to us in the pharma companies. And um, we have to do this kind of testing to make sure that um, suboptimal behaviors don't um, cause an adverse impact. So one of the things that we're seeking to do within Pharma Ledger, we've got two patient organizations, uh, we've got hospitals. Um, so we're asking these organizations to provide us feedback about how the product is used, and how the barcode will be used and scanned. And that's gonna help us identify uh, potential um, sticking points, no pun intended, <laughs> um, with how barcodes would be used. Of course, the, today there's already a barcode, uh, a 1D barcode, an EEN um, in, in Europe, which might be used for stock control. In the future, um, who knows where this would go? If we've got this one digital key, uh, perhaps the evolution of the barcode could move into stock control as well, automated ordering and even order the cash for payments. Um, we've seen innovation happen in some countries like uh, Singapore, where they've uh, been using blockchain for that very application. So um, great question. Great. Um, so the next question is, how will you address different GDPR regulations from various countries? Thank you. I, I can make a quick comment and and then turn it over. I mean, just just as from a principal perspective, um, the 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 idea is from uh, not to store any personal identifiable information on a blockchain because the but one of the benefits of blockchain is that it's uh, immutable and permanent. Is uh, something that of course um, kind of um, goes against the. GDPR principle that your right to be forgotten be forgotten. So, so generally, uh, we do not want to store any um, personal identifiable information on the blockchain, and 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 secondary, we don't want to capture any um, personal PII um, unless it's absolutely necessary. There are other use cases in Pharma Ledger, like the informed consent form, where of course you'll have a name, a birth date, and and everything. Um, to specifically ident identify a patient who's agreeing to undergo a specific procedure in a clinical trial. Um, but um, but that's, of course, use case specific, and the whole use case is about how to how to manage that. We have a we have a a work package dedicated for legal, uh, regulatory, and data privacy considerations, and um, and we are approaching these requirements on a on a use case by use case basis. And anything to add from the EPI perspective, Patrick or Ken? No, Dan, um, that, that's correct. I mean, from the EPI perspective, there's no intent, there's no need to be gathering um, information. And the one, we are not gathering any information. So I, I, I will say for the Pharma Ledger approach, one of the things I really like is the um, focus on experimentation. So we've got this blockchain as an idea, right? A notion that blockchain can deliver value. 
And we know that there's obstacles to any new technology. And um, as pharmaceutical companies and healthcare players, compliance is right up there. It has to be done. It's non-negotiable. So through the experimentation and the prototype testing, we get to challenge ourselves about GDPR compliance. Uh, are we doing enough? What else do we need to do? What do we need to change? And uh, the agile approach we're taking to the uh, development process allows us to do that and to learn with the real example, the real prototype, right? to take it away from theory and PowerPoint slides to actually look at a prototype and challenge it. Um, if it passes that step, great. If it doesn't and we need to do something, then we, we adapt it. So uh, the idea, of course, of having security and trust is paramount. So that, that's one way that we're uh, addressing mm -hmm. by testing. Okay, so next question, are you considering registering individual packages to patients, individuals to further prevent counterfeiting? Um, I can maybe take this, this is, this is an interesting uh, question. So um, there's, a, there's a, uh, another IMI project called Gravitate Health. And what they're seeking to do is to offer um, services to patients, connections with healthcare records to improve outcomes for patients where data and information is shared for the benefit of treating patients. Um, at this stage, we aren't considering uh, doing any registration of packages to patients, but there, there could be um, interesting use cases. If you are a chronic a chronically ill patient, and let's say you're taking 10 medicines, you know, um, that can be hard to track. You could have something called a, uh, uh, like a, a medicine cabinet where all the leaflets for your products are stored. Chronic patients tend to be interested in their leaflets, but they're not going to read it every time they get a pack. If we can um, push update information to them when the information in the package leaflet is enhanced, that could be interesting for them and their health health outcomes and how they manage their health conditions. So uh, I think that's that's interesting, but it's more future future state. <laughs> if that okay. makes sense. Yeah, I, I think this question also is kind of alluding to in the case of the EU when a pack is dispensed, it's, uh, it's, it's given a certain status so that if it's dispensed again or seen again, you would know. I, I think that's where this question is coming from. I, I, if I read it, if when I read it that way, um, so yeah. Okay. Okay. Maybe just to to build on Ken's information around Gravitate Health, so. Um, we are, as Pharma Ledger, we're collaborating with Gravitate Health on the, on the EPI project. Uh, you know, many of the of uh, our companies are are in both projects, or or even public partners are represented in both projects. So this is a great um, uh, opportunity to collaborate, kind of more near term on the on the creation and the uh, and the infrastructure of of um, EPI but longer term on the vision of how, how it could be consumed uh, in the future, the information. All right, uh, the next question I see, uh, can there be a universal barcode on the pack, ultimate harmonization across the global level? I will take a stab at this one. Um, in the ideal blue sky world, yes. Um, in the real world, probably no. Um, and I, I say this because uh, we have the existing barcodes in operation today. Um, if we take the data matrix code, the GS1 data matrix code that we use, say for US or for Brazilian or Argentinian or the EU and many other countries serialization, it's got certain data in there. Uh, you take what we have done for Russia, for example, it's you've got different information in there. You've each in a serial number, of course, but you have other information. You also then have OTC products that are not serialized in the EU, for example. 
Um, we also then have other markets where they use, like I, I mentioned earlier on in the presentation, the composite code for Japan, which is very inbuilt into their system. Um, so while it would be very beneficial to have a uh, one barcode that can do it all, um, I, I don't think that is, I don't see it being happening in the near to short term. That's all. I don't know, maybe Ken or Dan, you have a different opinion. I love this idea. <laughs> Wouldn't it be so good? I mean, it'd be much easier to run uh, global packaging operations if it was the same code. But yeah, that I, I agree with Patrick. I, I think that there are some countries which are very invested in a particular kind of code, and it's used for more than what API would be used. It's, it's got other uses in the value chain. Um, so uh, I, I think um, what is worth mentioning is in the serialized world, certainly for my company, um, around 90% of our volume is serialized today. Okay. So the non-serialized markets by volume are the minority. So we, we've seen uh, a set of standards used across different countries. I would say to this, wouldn't it be good if we could use the GS1 2D data matrix, which is the predominant one, um, where possible? And if it's not possible, wouldn't it be good if we had a way of having the interoperability, you know, allowing different barcodes to access digital information through a common platform? So although a universal barcode might not be on the horizon, um, there are many things we can do to meet the intent of that through interoperability. Okay, yeah, we have just, uh, Dan and Ken, we have three minutes left, so just to uh, keep an eye on the time. Okay, so I think we got time for one more question. Um, this one is, you suggest manufacturers to hold and maintain the information as there are far more manufacturing authorization holders than CAs, I guess that's competent authorities, the patients may experience more heterogeneity this way. Yeah, if I could just quickly take a stab at this one, Dan. Um, one of the reasons we're, um, we have suggested this is it's got to do with the batch specific leaflet, um, ultimately. I mean, when we go, regardless of if you have a centralized look, a centralized system with the leaflets, it'll have the latest leaflet. Um, so we always give the example imagine if one product had peanut, the other didn't have peanut, or vice versa. It's that type of scenario. So that's that's where we're looking at. And it's also liability. Today, we currently put the, it in there. We're liable for it. Um, so that was the, the rationale of having mm. it coming from the, uh, from the, the manufacturers. I, I maybe the uh, questioner, I, I think it's um, maybe they're hinting that, that the manufacturer presents this information in the way they want to. Uh, which I think is actually not the case in the future. Uh, the intention is that there is a standard, and um, you know the EMA has there uh, has defined um, key uh, principles for electronic product information last year, and and they're currently working um, um, on progressing EPI as a as a topic and as a standard within within the EU. So, so uh, it would it ultimately will be the opposite. Patients will experience more standardization in the presentation of this information um, as the standards emerge and are adopted um, there. So, I maybe maybe that's what they meant. I'm not sure. All right, I think we have reached the end of the of the session. So, um, thanks first to, to my colleagues, Ken and. Patrick for um, the great collaboration here, and um, Dan, Dan, sorry, yeah. Paul, could we take yeah. the last question there? Oh, uh, oh yeah, think, just so, just if we can. I mean, if we answer. Okay, quickly, uh, forty seconds. Universally, can a two D matrix codify conditional information so it would then be able to answer multiple queries? If not, can AR bridge the gap? Well, t uh, typically speaking, from the production perspective, we want to have as little information, if you will, in there from that perspective. But the information that we have in there is key. I mean, um, 
it doesn't need to have conditional information. I think in there, um, it it we coding there is it theoretically you can encode a lot into the codes, but um, from a manufacturing perspective, it's much easier if we don't do this. Um, but we can then with the use of the blockchain API solution, we can do that conditional information checks. I think. Mm. Okay. And uh, just for information, in the anti counterfeiting, we are experimenting with augmented reality to to show uh, a, a user what the packaging should look like and allow them to navigate around to some uh, other features. So, I think I think we've reached the end of our time. So thanks again, everyone, also for the for the questions, for the engagement, for your attention and time. Um, that's uh, much appreciated, and I hope that you um, got some benefits out of the session today. Any any last comments, Ken or, or Patrick? Uh, thanks everyone for your for your great questions. Um, it's it's always good to get these questions because it holds us accountable for the value that we're seeking to to bring. So it's much appreciated. Yeah, uh, I would echo that as well. So thank you everyone. Yeah. Thanks. Wish you all a great day. And a and a, a successful conference. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.